Uh, we haven't met before. My name is Adam, and I'm the pastor here. And what a privilege it is to have everyone here. And if you're new, man, come up. Love to meet you. Um, love to just talk to you about the church and get to know you. Uh, we are concluding our series we've been in for the past few months entitled uh, Jesus Stories, where we've been looking at the 37 different miracles of Jesus. And so you might be asking the question right now. So if we're concluding the series, what is up next? Well, next week is a standalone message. and We also have a special announcement, so you don't want to miss next week. The week following, we are going into a series we're calling a second priority. Second priority. So first priority is what? Is God. Second priority is our family. So we're going to be talking about family over the fall. Uh, over the fall. And uh, one thing I feel like the Lord's kind of drawing us into is because we know that the family unit is being attacked like Satan is trying to bring division within families, that's where he's starting. And we're just going to do some work, some very practical work, some spiritual work to sure up our, our families, amen. And so it's not going to be just for married couples though, it's going to be for widows, singles, so it's going to be for everyone. We are going to be doing uh, marriage small groups throughout the fall, so I encourage you to get involved with one of those. I know it's going to be a really powerful time. Uh, that's what the video is all about. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Marriage on the Rock. And so uh, Laura and I have gone through that uh, small group curriculum, and it is absolutely amazing. So I know it's going to be uh, really good for everyone and for the church. How many is excited about what's to come? Yep. So I've entitled my message this morning as we conclude the series, Jesus Stories, Take It to the Streets. If you'd like my notes, you can text notes to the number that is coming up on the screen. What's in front of me will become in front of you. Maybe not. They don't have that back in the back. They'll get a second service. You can go to the Journey app to get it, though. If you have the Journey app, you can download that. In the app store, you can te uh, search uh, Journey Church Jacksonville, I believe, and it will come up. And you can find my message notes uh, there. Or what? Or scan the back of the, of the seat there, I think, and it'll come up. Uh, so Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to find ourselves. If you want to get your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. While you're turning there, let me kind of give you some backstory of where we are at here at this moment in Acts chapter 8. So at this point, the church worldwide is about as big as a few thousand people. And they're all gathered really in one city, which is Jerusalem, even one nation, but mainly just in one city. And they've encountered the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. They've gone through this progression of hearing the stories of Jesus. They've experienced all that. And now what's happening as they're gathering in the city of Jerusalem is they're just kind of comfortable, staying put, enjoying life together and what Jesus had done for them. And all of a sudden, they get this first wave of persecution that happens. So persecution comes against this early church, forcing them out of Jerusalem. And so uh, Philip, who is known as also Philip the Evangelist, he is pushed out into Samaria, and he begins teaching the gospel to the people in Samaria. What's incredible is this revival begins to take place in the city of Samaria. Uh, Philip sees many people be saved, uh, miracle signs and wonders, many people being water baptized. And what happens is Paul and John hear word of this revival happening in Samaria. And this is where we're going to pick up and begin to read in verse 14 of Acts chapter 8. It says this. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they had only been water baptized at this moment. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now let's skip down to verse 25 and 26 here. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they, they is talking about Peter and John, they returned to Jerusalem. 
Take note of that, that they returned to Jerusalem. Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. Remember that. So they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Let's pray. Hmm. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence that's in this place right now. Lord, I pray that, God, you would take your Logos word and you would make it alive in our hearts. They would become rhema to us. Lord, we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that every single person in this room would hear the still, small voice of your spirit. And so, God, we say, speak, for your servants are listening. God, I've come today humbled by you, Jesus. Lord, none of us can do anything worthwhile without your spirit and without your presence. So would you rest upon me and would you rest upon this place? We desperately need you and we humbly ask, God, for you to speak to us, to challenge us, to send us out, God, that, Lord, we would live on mission for you. Lord, there's a world that is hurting and dying, a world that is torn up, and, God, we, through your Spirit, are the hope of this world, through the power of your Spirit. So, Father, we thank you, we love you, we've come to bless you today. Everyone said amen, amen, amen. You know, I believe that we are in the same place right now as the people in the early church in Acts chapter 8. We're at a pivotal moment in our particular history. Think about it. We've heard the stories of Jesus at this point. We've gone through nearly every single miracle throughout the New Testament. The book of Acts, that early church, knew even more of the miracles of Jesus because it said that at the end of Mark that if all the books in the world couldn't contain the miracles in which Jesus did. So they heard the stories of Jesus just as we've heard the stories of Jesus. I believe that we've experienced the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in this house. I hear over and over again people coming to the church and saying, man, God is there. God is in that place. I'm telling you, that is the highest Compliment, if it's a compliment at all, that we could, that's the, that's the one thing that I want to hear more than anything else, is I could feel the power and the presence of Jesus. Because we got Jesus, we got everything we need. In Acts chapter 2, they experienced the Holy Spirit. I believe right now, at this particular moment in time, we're in Acts chapter 8. Because what was the command of Jesus to this early church? To go into all the world and to what? Preach the gospel to every creature. Is a command. Is a command. He's not asking us to do it. He's commanding us to do it. It's not a question. He is telling us, just as he told that early church, I'm commanding you to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. The question is, will we be obedient to what God is asking us to do? I think God gives us kids so that we can experience how he feels at times. I'll go in to my kids while they're watching YouTube and eating Cheetos, and I'll say, hey, go clean your room. I'll come back five minutes later, and what are they doing? They're still watching TV, and they're still eating Cheetos. I love Cheetos, y'all. Anybody else have experienced that before? Know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about Cheetos because everybody loves Cheetos. I'm talking about seeing your kids act like that. You know what I'm saying? The real question is, is as a church, are we going to be obedient to what God is asking us to do, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel? 
So what pushed this early church out to evangelize Judea, Samaria, and to go into the ends of the earth? Persecution. They were still in Jerusalem, enjoying the safety of their own town, but not yet going out into all the world and preaching the gospel. So what happened? Persecution. God is going to send us out one way or the other. Either we are going to be obedient to his word and what he's commanding us to do, not asking, not a question, but commanding us to do, or he's going to allow persecution in our life to then send us out. I think the American church has experienced safety for far too long. And by and large, we sent more missionaries around the world than any other country. But still, I believe we're still sitting in our safe places, enjoying the comforts of life, because that's what we chase after, is comfort more than anything else in the time and the seasons in which we live. And I believe the Lord is going to allow a season of persecution to come upon the church because then it will push us out. But I'm here to tell you this morning, we don't have to experience persecution in order for him to send us out. We can simply just obey God. Will we, the question is, will Journey Church be a church that hears the commands of God and is sent out into the highways and the byways to be what God has called us to be to this world. And it's different for each, each individual. You have a calling, you have a purpose that is different than my purpose and my calling. Will you step up to the plate and will you be who God's called you to be and walk in boldness and walk in courage or will you continue to sit back and to wait? And I'm guilty, y'all. I'm just as guilty as you are. I want the comforts of this life. I, I want the nice cars. I want the, the, the large house. I'm, I'm guilty. In the last days, God says he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. His sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will dream dreams. Old men will see visions. There's going to be a revival that sweeps this nation, I believe. But I also believe in the context of that, it's going to happen as the church is being persecuted. Because why? Because then they become desperate for Jesus. Will we be desperate for Jesus even in our own comfort? Can we be? Can we be? Can you hunger and thirst for Jesus and his righteousness? That you would turn from sin, you'd walk in holiness. That this would be the desire of your heart just to be near Jesus. It's David when he wrote this one thing I desire, and this alone I seek, that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. You see, he's a king at this particular moment in time. He's a king. He's enjoying the comforts of life, yet his heart is so desperate for Jesus. Can we still enjoy the comforts without persecution and be desperate for Jesus like David was? Can we do it? So this early church, this early church was commanded to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to every creature, yet they hung out in Jerusalem and took persecution to drive them out. So I want to give you three things this morning that held the early church back from fulfilling the mission of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And three things this morning that also holds us back. So number one this morning, the first thing that I want to give you today is this. We don't take Jesus to the streets because of fear. We don't take Jesus to the streets because of fear. These early Christians, they, were felt, they felt comfortable where they were. They felt safe. They knew Jerusalem. They knew where they lived. They knew the temple. It was traditional. They were comfortable there. It was their place. They knew if they stepped out that they might experience resistance. So they stayed where they were. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 9, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, in other words, the reason for the first statement is this, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. (laughs) 
We love that verse, God does not give you a spirit of fear, but of love. But what is it about? So you can share your testimony and not be ashamed. And Paul writes this while he's in prison. It says, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. James starts off his book addressing these early Christians in Acts, this early church after they left Jerusalem because of persecution. He writes this, James 1, 1 through 2. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Why were they scattered abroad? Persecution. He says, greetings, my brethren. Count it all joy when you, go, when you fall into various trials, knowing that that testing of your faith produces patience. The reason for these two scriptures that we all love to quote is because of the persecution of the saints in this early church. Not saying that our trial here today and what you might be experiencing is insignificant. I'm not saying that. God cares for every detail of our lives. He knows when the sparrow falls. But God allowed these trials of persecution in the early church so they'd share the gospel. That they would go into all the world and preach the gospel. There is something in all of us that feels an internal tension between excitement of an adventure and the fear of an adventure. What does adventure mean? Adventure means you're going to face some trials. You know, I believe inside all of us is this desire to be great for God. Like he's put that inside of you that you would be great, that you would do great and mighty things. You would do good works for the kingdom of God. That I don't think that anyone in this room wants to be mediocre, do we? And there's this desire for adventure. I don't know about you, but I was an adrenaline junkie when I was younger. I remember uh, growing up, you probably get in trouble for this nowadays, but uh, my dad and I, we would go, uh, we had a lake house in the summertime that we stayed at, and my dad and I would go jump off a bridge, and, and we loved it. We'd go off the bridge into the lake, and it was absolutely incredible. Do not do that, okay? Do not do that. I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I would love to go on roller coasters. I was an adrenaline junkie. Maybe some of you in this room, you could say that was a bad example. Maybe you could say, man, I want to travel the world. Right? I want to see the world. I want to see Europe. I want to see China. I want to see all these different places. The world has a lot to see. But when ex- traveling the world, you're going to experience some um, things along the way, right? But you've got to step out of that safety net. And there's always this tension between adventure and safety. Some of you are like, man, I don't want to step out because you experienced some trials and some hurt along the way. You say, Adam, I don't know about all that. I'm going to kind of just stay in my safe cocoon. I don't want to travel. I don't want to go anywhere. My house is just fine. I'm going to take vacation. I stay at home. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stay-at-home type of vacation instead of going out. You know, like you're that type of person. Some of you maybe in this room. So there's always this tension between adventure and safety. God has innately put inside of us this desire for adventure To not be mediocre, to be great, but because of stuff happening in our lives, we've chosen maybe to be safe. And sometimes God will call us to do great things for his kingdom, but we're super hesitant to step out. I'm no different, y'all, by no means. I've had, in sharing the gospel, I've had some very successful times, but I've also had some very unsuccessful times too. I remember one of my... uh, one of the moments that just really, you know how when you lead someone to the Lord, it just, man, it, this is feeling inside your heart that you just can't, you can't replace. Uh, there was a, I was probably 22 years old, and uh, this man named Hakeem, uh, I met, and he was a Muslim, and I started sharing the gospel with him, and it took some work to kind of build a relationship with him and get to know him. And because he was Muslim, he was very hesitant to accept Jesus in his heart. Because what it meant to him was that then, it was as if his family was then going to go to hell. So it's hard for him to accept that, and his father had just passed away. And I said to him, Hakeem, listen, like, if you give your heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to help you. And I believe your whole entire family is going to be saved. We're going to pray for that together. And so along the way, as I began to share the gospel with him, he came to Jesus. It was like one of those moments in time where I was like, man, Lord, thank you so much for letting me lead this man to the Lord. And we had a relationship for a while, and 
It was really beautiful and incredible knowing that he was going to go to heaven and he overcome this difficulty of being a Muslim and went to the one true God. I've had moments though too where I've shared the gospel and it just didn't turn out the way I wanted to. There was a man named, named James. When I first uh, moved here to Jacksonville and I was looking at a house and we were uh, looking at different houses and I was in the San Marco area and I was just walking around. Laura was still in Charleston, which is where we lived at the time. And I met this man while I was walking around, James, and I remember he had a cast on his foot and uh, he was just looking for help. And so I helped him out. I asked him, man, do you know Jesus? He said, no. I started talking to him about Jesus. And I even went so far as I just said, man, I believe that the Lord's going to heal your foot. So I boldly, I was walking in super boldness right at that moment. I boldly knelt down. I laid my hands on this man's foot who I just met. And I prayed for God to heal his foot. I prayed for God to save his soul. I don't know what happened. I know his foot didn't get healed that day. It might have got healed later. I don't know. He didn't give his life to Jesus that day. And along the way, we can let these moments where we boldly stepped out cause us to be discouraged to share our faith. But we just simply have to listen to the voice of God and trust the Holy Spirit that he's going to do the work. That he's going to draw all men to him. We're simply, I believe that I, I, uh, I placed a seed in that man's heart that day. And I believe that, man, he's going to come to Jesus. Whether this was over 10 years ago now. And I believe that at this point, I pray that he's come to Jesus. So we can't let fear bind us from sharing the gospel with other people. Amen? So the first thing that keeps us back from taking Jesus to the streets is fear. The second thing is this. We don't take Jesus to the streets because we've been divided into tribes. We don't take Jesus to the streets because we've been divided into tribes. Galatians gives us how we should be and act as Christians. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. You see, Paul had not written Galatians yet, so this early church didn't have this letter. Paul wrote this letter in Galatians some 30 years later after Acts chapter 8. Matter of fact, Paul, the writer of this letter, was still Saul at this time. He was the one doing the persecution of this early church. His conversion didn't happen for another five years or so after Acts chapter 8. And I just say all that because think about it. People can really change quickly, can't they? We've got to be able to give people grace. But this early church, they didn't want to share the gospel and go out because they didn't know how the Gentiles were going to receive it. They worshiped differently. They looked a little differently. Like they, the culture was different. And so they didn't want to go outside the walls because they didn't know how it was going to make them feel. We can't allow tribes to divide us. Racial tribes, cultural tribes, political tribes. We're all trying to be so divided, like the enemy is trying to divide us. We can't allow the enemy to succeed. We can't allow the enemy to divide us up into separate tribes. Mask, no mask. White, black, Asian. We can't allow us to be divided. We are under what? We are under one covering, and that is Jesus. One covering, that is Jesus. He doesn't see any difference. Man, what, is, what happened yesterday was so tragic. The enemy tries to bring situations like that where man goes in, it's a racially motivated crime, and he kills people. Tragic, right in our own backyard. The enemy is trying to do a work to separate us out. We as the body of Christ cannot allow that to happen. We've got to be people unified, coming together. The church is the hope for this nation. The church is the only hope. 
And if the church is divided over our stances on theology or our stances on different political issues, man, God, help us. We're missing it. May we come together and be unified and pray for situations like this, that the enemy wouldn't succeed in trying to divide us because that was utterly demonic. Utterly demonic would happen. Can we pray right now for our city? Lord, I pray for our city, Jesus. Lord, we ask for healing, God. Lord, I know there's many people, even in this room, who feel such hurt and pain. Lord, I pray for healing to come, that God, you would restore, God, just, just strength and unity amongst your body. Lord, we pray for the demonic forces that are trying to attack and to tear us apart. The body of Christ will not be torn apart. For Lord, you don't see anyone differently. We're all under the roof and the headship of you, Lord Jesus. So God, would you bring healing to those families, God, who are experiencing so much pain right now? Lord, our story wouldn't be disunity, but it would be unity, God, in our city, in our nation, Jesus. We thank you for that, God. Lord, we need revival. We need a move of your spirit. Would you do what only you could do? Lord, you are our hope. Help our, the churches in this area, God, every Bible-leaving church, God, to love and to reach out, to help be the voice of sanity in an insane world. Thank you, Jesus. We can only do it by your wisdom and by your guidance. But we pray and ask for unity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first reason is fear. The second reason we don't take you to the streets is division. The third reason we don't take Jesus to the streets is because we doubt God. So listen to this. So here's the greatest revival in Samaria because the church is scattered because of persecution. Most people in Samaria, they get baptized. They give their life to Jesus. And the apostle Peter and John, after this revival subsides, goes back to Jerusalem. But then the angel of the Lord says to Philip, he says, I want you now to go to Gaza. Philip was the one who broke down these cultural barriers there in Samaria. Now watch this, Acts 8. 26, it says this, and the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, after this revival happened, he tells him, now go down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert, <laughs> which is desert. Am I the only one who's thinking right now uh, when you read that, if I'm Philip, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I think we should go to Athens. I think we should go to Greece. Like, hey, if we saw Caesar saved, like that's going to change the course of history. God, you're telling me to go to Gaza, which he makes very clear, which is desert? He calls him to the desert. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, God, I'm really doubting that I'm hearing your voice right now. I'm doubting that you're sending me to a place that is the desert. But watch what happens as Philip was obedient in what God asked him to do. Acts 8. So he arose and went, Acts 8, 27. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. So he was basically CFO of this powerful empire. He was in charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip, what? Say it. Ran. Philip what? He ran to him. You see, I think that God, he, he's okay if we obey him reluctantly. There's times where I obey him and I obey him reluctantly. But what he really wants is just hearing the voice, the small, still small voice, the whisper in your heart to go and to do something. And what do we do? It's called to do, just run. Run in boldness. Man, if we could get to that spot. Amen. If I could get to that spot. So look at this. And here, and, uh, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? 
And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? He doesn't understand because he's from a different tribe. This is a different tribe, a different race, a different nation. And Philip begins where he is. You see, we can't ask everybody to get where we are before we can talk about Jesus with them. We can't ask everybody to get where we are before we can talk about Jesus with them. They're necessarily not going to come into this room before they hear the gospel. You've got to tell them right where they are at. It says, in beginning where he was, he talked to him about Jesus. So, after a while, this Ethiopian is led to the Lord. Philip takes the time to explain it to him, what Isaiah was saying. And as he does that, he gives his life to Jesus. He's water baptized. Actually, there's a, there's a river or lake, a pond, something like that right nearby. And he's like, hey, let's go get water baptized. Let's go get baptized. And he gives his life to Jesus. Incredible. Best miracle of all when someone gives their life to Jesus. Amen? But watch, watch what happens. This is amazing. Verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. When they came out of the water, he was translated away, just taken, and then immediately he's found on the corner preaching the gospel in Azotus. I gotta really, like, my, my brain kind of goes this, this way. Like, it's Philip in that moment as he's being uh, took away over to uh, Azotus from this desert place in Gaza. Is he, when he stands on the, the corner preaching the gospel, is he wet? Like, I just wonder, like, is, is he wet? Like, if, am I, if I'm walking by him at that moment, I'm saying, hey, bro, like, why are you wet? Like, why is there a puddle right there as he's talking about Jesus? I don't know. Like, that's kind of going in my mind. But here's the point of all this this morning. Here's the point. What does all this mean? Two things. When you're doubting, you must know first. When doubting, know often the miracle is at the end of the desert road. The miracles at the end of the desert road. God sends Philip to Samaria, then down a desert road. Here's the thing. Oftentimes, God doesn't tell you what the result is going to be. <laughs> he just tells you what? To go. He just tells you to go. I mean, little does Philip know that as he goes down this desert road, it's going to be a story in the New Testament one day. If God was to tell you, okay, listen, if you leave this person to the Lord, it's going to be story told throughout the generations. Like, you'd be like, okay, Lord, I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. But Philip didn't know that. He just had to step out and go down the desert road. We must know that God doesn't always tell us the result. He just asks us to be obedient. The steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his ways. He orders our steps. He's going to tell us what to do. He may not tell us what the result is going to, do, going to be, but he asks us to be obedient. And some of you in this room, you're darkest and hardest road you walked down was God calling you into the desert and now he's going to give you a miracle. Amen? Second thing it means when you're doubting. When doubting, no, God uses ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. Philip, he was a steward. Basically, he's a waiter. God didn't use Paul, John, or Peter to do some amazing thing and save the city of Samaria and to lead this eunuch to the Lord, who did he use? A waiter, a steward. So what this means is that anyone at the sound of my voice right now, you don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to be in ministry, like the Lord can use you right where you're at. No matter where you're at in your, in your walk with the Lord, he can use you. He wants to use you as you submit yourself to him. Just be willing to take you to the streets. Just be willing to be obedient to the Lord. 
Share Jesus everywhere you go to everyone you encounter. Because we have a choice as believers. Either we are going to be obedient to the Lord, what he's calling us to do, which is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. Either we're going to be obedient or I'm afraid, church, God could allow persecution in our life for it. It's very evident. They were pushed out because they were still hanging out in Jerusalem 10 chapters into the book of Acts, some five years later, after the ascension. May we be a people who obey quickly. This world is hurting and dying, and we are the hope as we carry Jesus to this world. Would you rise with me?